Hi, Graham. Hi, Maureen. Are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, um, we're talking across a long distance, both in space and time, so this is better be interesting. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's, um, let's start by introducing ourselves to the folks at home or wherever they're watching this strange broadcast. Uh, I'm Graham Priest, and I'm a philosopher at the University of Melbourne and the City University of New York, and sometimes at the University of St Andrews, and at the moment I happen to be in Australia, in Melbourne. Okay, that's me. Um, and I'm Maureen Eckert, and I uh, am a philosopher at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. And uh, I guess we are about to embark on um, an adventure. Everything you ever wanted to know about deviant logic, but were afraid to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Should we, we ask people who emailed in their questions, shall we? Uh, well, I, I, you know, <laughs> I've got my list. Um, oh, and wow. As you know, that UMass Dartmouth, we have a, an undergraduate program that also teaches undergraduate philosophers um, a lot about deviant logic. So um, I think I'd love to start off our conversation just talking about the nature of non-classical logic and right, okay. because it depends right. on who you ask what what they'll tell you that actually is. So sure, let's hear from you. Okay, well, let, I mean, let's think about classical logic for a start. Mm -hmm. uh, and the name is something of a misnomer because it, it certainly gives the impression that it goes back to the classical period. You know. Greece or Rome or maybe even ancient Egypt, who knows. But you know, nothing like that is true because it was essentially an invention of um, logicians around the end of the 19th and early 20th century, particularly Frege and Russell. Uh, and of course it has connections with uh, logic as it had been taught and believed in before, but it was a very distinctive development in the history of logic. Mm -hmm. And now it's become uh, the kind of standard logic of our day. Um, so if you do an undergraduate course in philosophy, almost certainly the, the course you're likely to be, the, the sort of logic you're likely to be taught is uh, so-called classical logic. Okay, so much for classical logic. Um, Non-classical logic is stuff that has happened since then, and especially stuff that tries to rectify some of the inadequacies of so-called classical logic. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the inadequacies come in two kinds. Um, the first is the thought that in some sense classical logic is uh, expressly incomplete and so its expressive resources need to be extended by other devices. And things like modal logic are paradigm examples of this, also tense logic. But then there is a more radical kind of non-classical logic which says, hey, um, classical logic actually gets it wrong. Um, it's not just that it's incomplete, but some of the stuff that it has got goes astray. And things like paraconsistent logic and um, quantum logic are in this bag. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the developments in logic, especially in philosophy departments in the second half of the 20th century, concern the development of these non-classical logics. And uh, I think much of the action in philosophical logic is actually there nowadays. Okay. And when it comes to teaching logic, what do you think an ideal curriculum would be for students acquiring an understanding of the sort of state of the art in, um, in logic research? Um, I think the reason I, I sort of ask a pedagogical question straight off the bat is just remembering my own education in logic, um, a unfortunate bale of suffering. Um, and, and I think that there's some interesting stuff that I know we're trying at UMD and that maybe you have some insight into um, in terms of having developed, for instance, the, the textbook we use, right, your introduction to non-classical logic. And um, you know, what your sense of how we can advance um, undergraduate philosophy education 
such that they're not, it, it isn't A, a bale of suffering, but B, is, is much more receptive to, okay. to well, logic maybe you can as say, it is. Maybe you can say more about your own experiences in a minute. Okay, okay. Um, no, no. Let me uh, say how, how it is that I see it at the moment. Um, I think if anyone does a first course in logic, they should be taught classical logic, even though I'm one of the people who thinks it's wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, I think one needs to teach it first, for exactly the same reason that in, in say, physics class one teaches Newtonian dynamics before one gets onto special relativity. Um, you're never going to get your head around the more complicated stuff if you haven't got your head around the simple stuff in the first place. Uh, and the techniques that we use, the mathematical techniques that we use, uh, occur at their simplest, I think, in classical logic. Right. So I, I think that's where one should start. Um, although I th actually think when we do this, uh, as most people do when they teach um, a first course in logic, uh, but that is, they teach classical logic. Often it's taught very badly because it's, <laughs> it's taught as though it's some kind of God given thing that's just dropped out of the sky. And uh, you know, you've got, a, you've got a problem with this, never mind, just fill in the bloody ones and zeros and stop, uh, don't ask embarrassing questions. Um, okay, anyone with a history of logic knows. Anyone who knows about the history of logic knows that logic has been through many different changes of theory and so on, and there are always embarrassing questions to be asked, and certainly in philosophy departments, we should be asking people to ask these embarrassing questions, because that's the way the subject progresses. So I think we should teach logic in the same way we teach any other branch of philosophy. I mean, you, mm. you would never go into a philosophy of my class and say, well, here's functionalism, it's got, um, uh, just, just learn it, fill in the sort of functional ones and zeros as it were and that's the end of it. I mean, that, that's a crazy way to teach philosophy, any branch of philosophy. The logic is exactly the same. So I, I think we should teach uh, classical logic in the same critical spirit that we teach any, any branch of philosophy. Well, that, that's interesting because if we sort of only teach it as, um, as the organon in, say, kind of Aristotelian way, thinking it only just as this tool that is sort of God given or, or or just set, and then we use that tool. We're not really teaching the the active philosophical um, research behind, and you know, a growing field. Logic isn't simply or merely a tool. Um, no, uh, of course it is a tool, but it's much more than that as well. <laughs> Well, they're, they're um, stakeholders in different positions as they emerge, and those oh, map to very different philosophical views in metaphysics. Sure. Well, maybe we should come to that. Yeah. Maybe we should come to that in a minute. But I mean, let, let's move on to a, a second course in logic. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, in most universities, if you if you do a second course in logic, it's almost certain to be on meta theory. You know, soundness, completeness, maybe some stuff on the meta theory of arithmetic. Now. Meta theory is interesting and important, and if you're going to be a, a paid-up, card-carrying logician, you need to know this stuff. However, most students who are philosophy students are not going to go on and be card-carrying logicians. So they need to know the stuff that's going to be useful and helpful to them uh, in philosophy. Okay, now look, if you open the pages of the journals nowadays, and see which bits of logic are being applied in philosophy of language, philosophy of science, metaphysics, uh, and so on. What you'll see is a constant use of uh, modality, counterfactuals, truth value gaps, fuzziness, um, paraconsistency. Uh, so these are all the sort of techniques uh, that are, are deployed in non-classical logics. And so students, philosophy students, really need to know about those just because they're going to meet them when uh, reading philosophy, and indeed the whole gamut of techniques in non-classical logic give uh, people a bunch of tools, a toolkit, that they can use in their own work in, in, in philosophy. Hmm. So I think that in a philosophy department, a second course in logic really ought to be on non-classical logic. Okay. Yep. And I guess the the interesting problem, though, is that it is a kind of dark side of, you know, I think the perception of what deviant logic is, is that it's this, this other thing that 
is, and it, it does tend to be marginalized to some extent. Um, the, the question I have is sort of, well, what is behind this sort of bad rap that, um, that non-classical logic has, especially given what you've said about the sort of state-of-the-art work that, you know, contemporary philosophers who immersed in research are doing. So, so what's, yeah. what's with that? That, that? That's a really interesting question. I mean, look, it, it's partly a function of the way that it's taught, I think, that it gives people the impression that cl classical logic is taught. It, it's, the, it's the only game in town. Um, and, of course, that isn't exactly a, a mind-broadening way to look at things. Um, but there, there, there are other facts at issue as well. I mean, there are certain philosophers of logic who have been immensely influential. Um, the most obviously in this context is Quine. Yeah, I was <laughs> thinking that. Um, and for all his radicalness about um, you no know, analytic synthetic distinction and so on, uh, in practice he was very conservative about classical logic. You know, and yes, I'm uh, very well aware of that. With arguments like change of logic, change of right. subject, um, it, it gives people a few quick one-liners with which to write off anything other than classical logic. And, you know, if, if you go around the world talking about logic, I mean, you'll meet these Quinean arguments trotted out to you again and again, and they actually don't survive much thought once you start thinking about what's at issue. However, you know, as I say, the influence of Quine has been enormous. Um, and in some sense, I think Quine's philosophy weighs like a, a dead hand over the subject, which is you know, lightening gradually as the years go on. However, um, I think it must almost be said, it must also be said that it depends on what country you're in, because uh, Quine's influence has been much stronger in the US than anywhere else, I think. That's not so that it hasn't been influential elsewhere, but uh, I think the attitude to non classical logics uh, is. Uh, much more tolerant outside the US. For example, I mean, uh, the UK has had dumb it around for many years to make people think that there are at least two games in town, classical logic and intuitionist logic, but dumb it had never had much of an influence in um, the, the US. Um, in Australia, it's different again because non classical logic here has been on the agenda for many years <laughs> and people. Yeah, you have a wallaby logic. <laughs> wallaby logic. <laughs> I've heard yes, about that. Thank you, John Burgess. <laughs> um, um, and, in, and in mainland Europe, too, uh, people are much more receptive to um, uh, techniques in non classical logic, partly because of the strong connection between uh, logic and uh, information technology, for example, with Johann van Bentham in the mm -hmm. Netherlands, or partly because of the influence of uh, Marx and Hegel's in Germany and Italy. So people are much more receptive to the ideas that, you know, knowledge including logic goes through phases and progresses and we ain't at the end yet. Okay. So, uh, oh, I'm not mentioning Asia yet, that's not another. Oh, I mean, that's but anyway, very interesting. Uh, but, but anyway, the point is just that uh, it, it really does vary enormously as, as you go across the world and, uh, and see what happens to logic in different places. And I think it behoves people who think they're in the centre of uh, the universe, whether that's um, New York or Oxford or Beijing for that matter, uh, to, to just remember that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but anyway, you're going to speak about your experiences. Well, I think that one of the, I mean, there are all sorts of unintended consequences to, you know, sort of changing a curriculum. And one of the really great things that I've noticed is simply by having, um, philosophy majors, minors, and interested students and staff um, recognize that there's lively debate going on right now with figures in logic and that there are different sides. So, so students are exposed to pluralism versus monism. They sort of get their sense of what, the, what on, excuse me, of the the different research in, in relevance logics and in substructural logics, for instance, they they have a sense of what what um, what's going on now, and that there are real researchers in the here and now doing doing this work, 
they become very, as a result, they become much more excited about the subject. Um, instead of it being sort of like a, a maths class, it, a, a logic class can be just, I think you had mentioned, you know, just as lively um, a, a class at, uh, as would be philosophy of mind or epistemology or metaphysics or, or even history of philosophy the way I teach it. Um, students love to have, um, I don't know, they, they, I, to, what I've observed is students love to have a, a good battle to, to sort of take sides with. Um, and they, of course, love the fact that there's this thing, deviant logic. <laughs> Believe me, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big seller. Um, you know, the, the rebelliousness that comes along, I mean, the intellectual rebelliousness I think uh, philosophy students tend to have is, is, is met by exposing students to contemporary debate in non-classical logic and, and letting them know their sides because that is a motivator um, that, that, like I said, is, it's almost in a kind of unintended consequence, but students at, in my program tend to be um, shockingly much more excited about logic than, you know, it's the cool thing to do, <laughs> study logic, you know, and we have, no. um, you know, we have faculty willing to, to sort of go the distance with them, and, and, and that makes a difference as well, but uh, students themselves have to like a subject, in, in kind of intrinsically, to be motivated to do well at it. I mean, it's, it's really that simple. Now, I guess if you feel as though you're in the middle of a, a live and exciting philosophical debate, that's more likely to, to charge you up it than is. if you're just told to fill in the ones and zeros. It, it really is, and I think um, that's been one of the best ways for bringing, I think, students together who have very diverse interests in philosophy. So this is sort of another additional observation. Um, you'll have philosophy majors at, uh, that are interested in Heidegger and continental work, history philosophy, or contemporary analytic philosophy, whatever it is. But my interesting discovery is that students with very diverse interests can sort of meet um, on this this non-classical plane, as it were, so that people who, who, you know, are interested in looking at, you know, the Heideggerian analysis of, right, the discipline will, will be finding interesting things to say and useful things from your work, for instance. And historians, students studying with me, will find very interesting connections to antiquity and, and the development of philosophical writing and philosophical um, logic. So there's, yeah, I think that's true. There, there's a kind of weird unity you can get out of this that I thought that I thought was very interesting. And it wasn't that we planned it this way. It's just, you know, seeing how very different philosophy majors find non-classical logic and their training in it intrinsically interesting, whatever their, their other interests in philosophy are, their main interests are sort of met by this one, one aspect of their study of logic, mm. which is sort of like, okay, <laughs> let's give them more of that. That's, that's sort of a, a, you know, a very nice thing to have in a curriculum. Um, yeah. Okay, well maybe yeah. we've talked well, long enough about <laughs> non-classical logic in general. Uh, let's, um, let's come down to some more specifics. Yeah, yeah, um, because I think besides the division between non-classical and classical logic, there's a lot of um, confusion about what paraconsistent logics are and, and dialethism, and I th can't think of anyone better to, to elucidate that difference, which is pretty important. Yeah, okay. Well, I think it's true that Paraconsistency tends to be something of a, a, the bad boy of non-classical logics, which gives it its charm, I must confess. But um, 
maybe we should just make sure that people know what power consistency right. is so that they know what we're talking about. So in classical logic, but also in intuitionist logic, once you have a contradiction, everything follows. Um, so the medieval name is X falso quadlibet. I rather prefer the more colourful name, explosion. Because once you've got a theory which contains a contradiction, something of the form P and not P, then everything follows. So the theory explodes into triviality. Um, this is kind of a counterintuitive principle of inference. I mean, if you, you know, ask your first year students, does it follow from the fact that Melbourne is in Australia and not in Australia that for example, uh, the moon is made of green cheese, I'll tell you, no, of course not. However, you know, it's part of the orthodox logic of our day. And a paraconsistent logic is precisely one where this principle of inference is not valid. So in which an arbitrary contradiction does not imply an arbitrary conclusion. And paraconsistent logics have now been developed, I guess, since the 1960s. Um, and I think they got a very bad rap at the start because everyone thought that and people who had just studied classical logic thought this was kind of crazy. However, the subject as a subject is now well entrenched, whatever you think about it philosophically. Um, so it has its own uh, code number, for example, in the uh, American Mathematical Society Code of uh, Philosophical Topics. Um, there are many paraconsistent logics. It's not like intuitionism, which just has one logic essentially. There are many paraconsistent logics, but they all have well-known model theories, proof theories, algebras, and so on. So, in, in some sense, the technical runs are on the board, uh, and no one can now deny. I think that paraconsistent logic is a well-established part of logic. In the same way, maybe that non-Euclidean uh, geometries were well-established geometries in the 19th century, if I one ever put to use. So, dialecism, what is the, the difference between the commitments that push further into um, dialecism for, you know, the position for which you're known as the Prince of Darkness? <laughs> well, um, okay. power consistency is one thing. <laughs> But, um... <laughs> okay, well look, dialethism is the view that some contradictions are true. Um, so some things of the form P and not P are true. Mm -hmm. um, and the most important thing to note first up is that paraconsistency and dialethism are not the same thing. So paraconsistency, uh, the orthodoxy of explosion is for a relatively late in the history of logic. Um, I mean, the principle of inference doesn't appear until around the 12th century. It certainly doesn't become orthodox until you know, the early 20th century. Um, whereas dialethism is quite different. Um, dialethism says, in effect, that one should reject the law of non contradiction. And the law, law of non contradiction has been high orthodoxy right. in the history of Western philosophy since Aristotle's rather bad tempered and rambling attempt to. to um, Defended, which, you know, ham handed as it was, but was enormously successful historically because it entrenched the principle into Western philosophy. Okay, so that's to distinguish between paraconsistency and dialethism. Now, the, the next important thing is to realize that um, there are many applications of paraconsistency that have absolutely nothing to do with dialethism. Right, right. Um, and in fact, the majority of paraconsistent logicians are not dialethists. So, uh, for example, paraconsistent logic has information, has applications in information right. processing. Of course. We are frequently dealing with uh, corrupt or inconsistent that's data. Right. You have to have something to do with it. The, that's yeah. not just crashing the system or basketing. That's it. right. Um, and there's no algorithm for getting rid of inconsistency. So you've got to live with it in that sort of context. Right. right. And you don't want your inference engine to blow up in your face just because there's some lurking contradiction. Um, but also, I mean, there, there are many other theories in the history of philosophy and the history of science, which were bloody obviously inconsistent, and, and people knew this was the case. So, for example, um, in uh, the original infinitesimal calculus, as it was formulated by people like Leibniz and Newton, uh, 
you had to assume at one point in the calculation that the derivative, say, that the infinitesimal was non-zero. And then another place you had to assume it was zero. Uh, and the calculus got a lot of flack, particularly by people like Barclay, because um, it, was, it was built on these inconsistent foundations. Now, of course, it was reworked, and it was reworked two or three hundred years, well, two hundred years later, in such ways to get rid of infinitesimals. But that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that for a couple of hundred years, the theory of um, calculus, the theory of infinitesimals, was an inconsistent theory in which people proceeded perfectly sensibly. So uh, whatever inference engine they were using, uh, it must have been power consistent. Now we can argue about what it was they used and so on, mm. those are interesting that issues. Interesting. But um, just from the point of view of understanding the history of mathematics and the history of philosophy, where also there are you know, inconsistent theories that go knocking around, like Hegel, uh, it's, it's important to, you know, one doesn't ruin the understanding of these theories by simply applying explosive logic. Okay. But um, you still haven't quite, I mean, that, that was very helpful, but I guess I think a lot of people are very interested in the shift to dialethic logic and the commitments that that forces one to, to take on, at least in, especially in your version, but yeah, I'm thinking there's a couple of versions, but, um, but what, what can you say about that move? Um, Okay, well, this has been sort of largely debt clearing at the moment um, <laughs> because uh, people, I think, too frequently confuse dialethism and power consistency. Uh, and as okay. I've been at pains to labour, you can be a power consistent, you can believe in power consistent logic without being a dialethist. Of course, if you're a dialethist, you better believe in that power consistent logic gives, oh, a power consistent logic gives the right account of uh, validity. And of course, you don't really want to suppose that everything is true, I and mean, that's a bit too much. Um, so, uh, the next question then is why one might suppose that uh, some contradictions are true. Uh, and now we have to engage with the arguments for dialethism. And, and there are many of these, mm -hmm. but I suppose most people's favourite is um, the paradox of self-reference, things like the lie paradox. Um, and there's a history going back nearly two and a half thousand years of People trying to explain that something's gone wrong in the, the reasoning that leads to the, uh, the, the, the like contradiction, uh, which hasn't been very successful, at least judged by the amount of consensus that is achieved in, say, two and a half thousand years. So, um, the thought of dialethism in this area is that um, people have been going about the wrong way, and they, we just should accept the paradoxical arguments as veridical, that is, as establishing that. Uh, certain contradictions are true. Okay, but there's, um, I guess there's more than one type of dialethism, and I had alluded to that just a few minutes ago, and, and yes. maybe sort of push one step further and talk to, talk to speak to that, um, that difference. Well, even even in the realm of paradox of self-reference, there are disagreements between dialethists about how to proceed. So, uh, for example, J.C. Bill has this view according to which uh, there are dialethists, but um, they're engendered by uh, what you might call semantic overexpressiveness. So J.C. thinks that uh, we need a truth predicate for expressive reasons. I think that's, that's, that's a good argument. Um, but the only dialethes that occur are the ones that arise because this novel expressive power, given by the notion of truth, allows you to formulate contradictions which are not there in the world, as it were, but which arise because of this expressive power. We can use the word spandrels for this. Right. And a deflationary um, model. Right. Yes. Here's a deflationary model of truth. Uh, and um, the contradictions are, they're true enough, but they're, they're generated by a conceptual apparatus, as it were. But, I mean, that's going to then mean that your view is a lot stronger. Um, you are, if I'm 
correct or correct me if I'm wrong, um, making a stronger claim that there are, right, there's something in the world, you know, well, both yeah, true I mean, and false. I, I, I think that uh, there are contradictions in the world. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that is a very misleading thing to say, so let okay, me just no, clarify no, yes, a bit. No. Um, if, if something is true, uh, if a claim is true, it's true because of two things. Um, firstly, the meanings of the words or the concepts we apply, and secondly, the way the non-linguistic world is, the thing that our language talks about. It. And both of these have to conspire to make something true, generally speaking. Right. So, just to say that um, some contradictions are merely semantic, I think is um, is wrong simply because it takes the world to conspire just as mm -hmm. much as language to produce these things. And in, in that sense, I think there are contradictions in the world. Okay. But what sorts of things are these? I mean, there are, certainly you're not speaking of, say, a quotidian object. The mountain is not the mountain, you know. It, that, well, I mean, I mean this takes, where are you? Well, this I mean, takes into the, the thing people of have such such a problem about, right? They, right, the, that there really is. I mean something about the world that is going to be both true and false simultaneously. Yeah, well, I mean, this takes us into the question of where else one might expect to find diabetes apart right. from the paradox of self-reference. Right. Um, I actually think the most um, transparent situation where this arises is in um, systems of norms, uh, things like legal codes, because uh, it's um, it's actually quite possible to have a legal code which is about safe by duly constituted legislature and so on, which has laws of the form, you know, if anyone is in class A, then they have a right to do this. And if anyone is in class B, they haven't got a right to do this. I mean, think of voting or only property or whatever. Um, and at least when the times when the law was made, the thought that someone might be in both class A and class B would have been unthinkable. You know? Think about um, people of colour, women, Asians, um, Australians. Uh, yes, you know, as times change, uh, it can turn up that uh, someone is in category A and B. And until the law is changed, as it presumably will be in this mm -hmm. sort of case, uh, this person you know, does say have the right to vote and is forbidden from voting. Mm -hmm. um, and how the contradiction arises is perfectly transparent in this case because. Um, Legislatures have the ability to make certain things true by fear, uh, including uh, giving of rights and so on. Mm. Uh, and so I think it's not at all puzzling how inconsistency can turn up in this case. Do you think um, there are other cases? I mean, I'm, I guess one of the ones that jumps out, I'm, I'm not that bowled over by the, the legal case that you just gave, but something like the uh, like emotions. I mean, maybe taking it into more philosophy of mind, um, the idea that we, I mean, we already have terms, you know, about emotional states that are contradictory to, to right, a very real degree. What, what's bitter and sweet, you know, becomes bittersweet. Um, saudade in, in Portuguese, for instance. Um, there's, there's all sorts of ways that we have um, not just, I think, two separate um, sort of, you know, a cognitive state in competition with a, an emotional state, yeah. a sort of classic faculty psychology explanation, but, but two really very distinct emotions that are simultaneously yeah, look, at I th war. I think this is really interesting and really hard. Um, I've, I've often yeah. pondered this and not sure what to make about it. You're certainly right that we can have apparently contradictory attitudes towards people. I mean, you know, it's sort of very commonplace that you can love someone and, and hate them. them at the same time. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's an easier way out, of course, which is to say, 
it's not really the same thing you're loving and hating in each case. Yeah. And you love something about them and hate something about them. Now, I think that's, that's too short because often um, you can admire someone and despise them for it to be exactly the same reason. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think it's very, it's very subtle like that. Um, so think of a tyrant. I mean, you might despise them for the ability they had to do what they did, but admire them for the same thing. However, um, the next obvious move is that uh, love and hate or admiring and despising are not really contradictory. They might appear to be so. Right. The fact that you can love and hate somebody shows that these are not contradictory, that the loving and hating are not contradictory. So, um, okay. I think things are not as obvious as it might appear. So, I mean, if you, if you want to establish that emotions really are contradictory in this way, you've got to establish that there's a situation where you have some emotion um, and don't have that emotion. And that's much harder. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's certainly harder. Yeah, that would that yeah, and off the top of my head, that that would also just be a very strange thing to do. Even talking about emotions, though, it's sort of the lack of affect is not. I I don't know how that would work in terms of well, I love and have no affect towards them. That that it, something's not right about that objection, though. Um, it doesn't seem that that would work um, work well in, in just the discussion of emotions because that, that sort of lack of affect can't just take be a placeholder for you know the, the contradictory um, but you know that's that's off the top of my head mm. um, I, I think that you may have more to go on actually is what I'm saying but um, I mean, are there other ideas you have about the way that dialetheas are present in sort of experience? Well, um, there's all the stuff about motion, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, Rather than follow that up at the moment, uh, let's, let's mm -hmm. pursue the emotion a little bit more because uh, I think often where people write about the emotions in the most perceptive way uh, is in fiction. Um, oh. And if one is looking for situations where people have inconsistent emotions, I think it's quite likely it's, what one's going to find some fiction. And in fact, I, um, it's not uncommon in works of fiction for authors to describe the emotional states of uh, their characters in explicitly contradictory terms. Right, right. Uh, I, I know right. And I, I think the effectiveness of um, literary representations of that kind, or that, that they do resonate with actual lived experience, I don't think. I mean, I, th I think that the literary case is a, is a kind of special commutative case of what um, people experience at least you know at that phenomenological level you know you, you identify with a protagonist who has such states because you know what they're like um, or or you you have enough insight into similar states so I mean that's a, I think a very interesting topic because uh, you yourself I ah, have have done some really nice work uh, in a couple of publications um, that are short fiction. And one of my favorites of yours is Sylvan's Box. So, you know, you've experimented yourself with trying to get across, you know, the, the Minongian idea of right, a non existent object. Um, when it's, I don't know if people are familiar with the story, but we can. Help me out here. Yeah, um, well, that's got nothing to do with inconsistent emotions, of course. Um, right, right, no, we've, we've kind of. No, no, I, you, I, you've I, introduced I, I this. Um, but it's a short story about my old and now deceased friend, Richard Silver. Um, uh, and the action takes place after his death uh, at his property um, near Canberra, his farm near Canberra. Uh, and 
I am going through his effects and um, come across an inconsistent object. And I think I'm going to leave the plot there so that people can read the story <laughs> if they want to. It is, but it is really. um, the, the point of the writing the story was that people often said to me, look, I just can't get my head around what it would mean to. Uh, I just don't understand what it would mean for something to have an inconsistent property. Uh, and so the point of writing the story was to show that they can understand it very well. I mean, they might not be able to picture it in their mind's eye, as it were, but our understanding is much more profound than mere visualisation. And the point of writing the story was to get people to read the story and un understand the story. And uh, it seems to me that they, people who read the story understand what the situation described is. Uh, of course, it's a fictional situation. Um, uh, but I, I, th I think, you know, there's more than one sort of inconsistent object in the story. Um, what do you have in mind? Maybe. I mean, whether, whether you intend it or not, of course, there's the box that's discovered and what it's like and the descriptions that are sort of working a reader to, to understand that mystery and, and unpack it, you know, at least to have a, a sense of what that is. But there's also um, Richard, um, because a narrator, you, um, or sort of counterpart of you, is in mourning and there's a presence and an absence simultaneously, right? In, in, the narrator's description of the experience of right, a person who's gone, who's not there, but is there too, right? There's, there's a, I mean, to me, the, that was a very effective part of that, reading that story is uh -huh. that, you know, you're there doing something else besides just discovering the box and figuring out what it is. Okay. There's also a person that, I, I mean, I, I just thought it was a lovely part of the narrative because it gives us, there's a, there's a, there's a real drama uh, at, a, at a certain level about presence and absence. Okay, I must confess I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, do, do you think the presence and absence is literally a contradiction? Um, that he's sort of present in one sense and absence in, a, absent in another? I think the experience of having of loss of a person is profoundly contradictory, and it may be, maybe maybe that goes back to our other um, discussion just a moment ago. Um, I think it's hard to to sort of describe which is why I'm sort of just pointing to it as an aspect of the story in which if you've experienced loss of someone but they're still with you, it really is part of the, the, the grieving process is how there's someone there. That experience doesn't get cashed away and just to nothing. And at the same time, there is loss and and I don't know how to reconcile um, sometimes the the feeling of the people I've lost that I have for them and um, and maybe some of the irreconcilability of loss is about okay. I, I mean it, it this is a literary point metaphorical in the highest degree no no but it's a good but, example of how uh, fiction is very good at uh, characterizing emotions or cognitive states, because um, and what you're describing is that you have an experience of the presence of someone, even though they're they're dead. Okay, and that sounds like a disambiguation. Okay, but it's 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 tougher than that because you have this phenomenological experience of their presence, but you also have a phenomenological experience of their absence. That's why it's so painful. Right, that's the absence is not me. Distance. Sorry, go on. So no, it, that's exactly right. Uh, I mean, we have a term, cognitive dissonance, but right. when we kind of look into the, the experience, it, it is much more complicated than just saying, well, here's one part, here's the other, there, you know, oh, faculty A, or conflict with faculty B, or I, I don't think the sorting of it, it you know, and, and sort of, 
into small chunks is actually what the experience is, which is just just painful and disorienting, right. dissonant in the extreme. And that's what the experience is. Yeah. No, the, the phenomenology so, is interesting because it's not just that they're kind of phenomenologically present and physically absent. I mean, you experience both the presence and the absence at the same time, as it were. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting thought. No, well, I thought it was a really, really good story. I mean, I, I have a sort of great love for fiction and especially, well, contemporary metafiction and, of course, ancient metafiction, um, Plato being the, the greatest metafictional author who ever lived in my... And you've written on Plato, too. <laughs> okay. I think at this point you probably ought to explain what metafiction is because uh, if, if people are like me or like... At least, like me, a couple of years ago, I had, I had no idea. So, why don't well, you explain? Metafiction, simply put, is literature that contains elements or some elements that draw attention to the text as a text. So it's it's a very self-referential um, type of literature, and there are many devices that. Uh, I, people are probably very familiar with in terms of uh, there being metafictional devices. So uh, authorial intrusion, for instance, as you're reading along a narrative and the, the author stops being anonymous or, or a, a sort of... Can, can you give a concrete example? Um, I'm trying to think of a good source. Um, Clarice Lispector... Um, Brazilian writer often wrote um, stories in which you'll start off as in a traditional narrative mode, right? The story begins, but then there's a break, and the specter, it put her in quotations, but an author writing the story begins to talk about the writing of the story. That would be an example of authorial intrusion. Uh -huh. um, things like uh, the Dictionary of the Khazars, which is a, just a phenomenal work, requires, it's a dictionary of right, this sort of lost um, culture, the Khazars, and, and the, with their, the terminologies and the work of, that they use and what's contained in the dictionary are sets of stories. So for each entry, you're actually uncovering a story that takes place in the present as well as in the past. It's a very complicated narrative done in the style of a dictionary. And the reader is simply invited to create, right? You can literally read the book in any way, from go, moving from entry to entry in any order to construct this story. But the author, in creating this narrative form that's so radical, has enabled the reader to participate in the creation of the narration that they that they actually are the reader and the construct the person doing the construction of the narrative simultaneously. So it's not the author simply going, "Oh, here's a narrative." It's an author going. Your party to the construction of this story, how you put together the book is, uh, you know, in terms of your reading experience, is what it is. There's right, a, a kind of self-referential um, acknowledgement that the reader is just as much a creator of right the, their own reading experience as the author would be. Right. Um, Cortazar's Hopscotch would be a very classic example of of a book that follows this pattern in um, Italo Calvino. Um, and then there, there are really interesting ancient versions of this. So you have, you have in the Odyssey, you have the, right, it's, the Odyssey is a, is, a, is a tale told by a bard, the bard being the author Homer. But within the Odyssey, there are, sections in which there's a story of the story itself is being retold as a, by one of the characters so in that kind of movement you see a doubling from of right the form itself is contains its own sort of microcosm it's sort of like a, 
you know, the, the, the perfect map of England contains the perfect map of England. Mm. So, but this is ancient stuff. And Plato, in my opinion, uses tons of metafictional devices in his own work that were, you know, that aren't surprising given the, the, the sort of different types of writing available and, and alive you know, the different genres alive, right. you know, at the time of his writing. I, I guess an obvious question, since uh, metafiction implies self-reference, uh, is whether you think it might generate paradoxes of its own? That's a great question. I actually can't really think of a direct, I, I maybe, I would love to find out if there really has been an attempt to create paradoxes that aren't these sort of emotional um, paradoxes we just talked about with your story. Um, there are lots of looping narratives. So whether we're talking about Finnegan's Wake or David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest, but there's tons of, of uh, works um, that address um, sort of the way in which a story is its own ground and just keeps retelling itself over and over. So, so Rosencrantz and Guildenstern would be a very good example of that. So every time the story happens, it's sort of going to lead back to its next production. Um, so I was just thinking of the, the Borka story, um, mm -hmm. Circular Ruins. Yes, And if I yes. remember right, it's about someone who dreams a person. That's right, um, that's right. And uh, they, they work hard on this. And uh, they actually realize a character in their dreams. And uh, the, the sort of punchline of the story, I think we can reveal this one, is yeah. that uh, the person realizes that they themselves are just a dream. And they've been dreamt by yes. somebody else. So um, there's a situation in which um, you, you, you take it for granted that they exist, the, the, the narrator, and it turns out they don't exist. But of course, if they don't exist, who's, who has been doing the dreaming? Maybe, maybe this, now here we're coming close to paradox? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think so. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the more I've been thinking about this sort of question, the more interested I am in, in even trying to construct my own I, you know, you know, try for different forms of right, paradox. There's right, there are multiple paradoxes. So exactly what one would be the most successful in literature is a, is a great question too. Right. right, a simple liar statement might really take a lot of work, but could be done. But that might be different than other paradoxes. Well, I think I'd like to be able to do much something much more interesting than the liar paradox. What what is your what what I, what would your well, idea be? I don't have any sort of great ideas off the yeah. off the cuff. Um, I mean, the Borges story is interesting, right? And actually, yeah. the Borges story reminds me of something else, um, which is certain situations in in certain bits of Buddhist philosophy, which is an area which is also ripe for exploiting various contradictions. And uh, you know, if you read Zen texts, they're just full of contradictions, right? Right. And maybe these are just ways of. Um, expressing oneself well that that's not the question let's not get into that now but in, in certain kinds of um, buddhism particularly yogacara there's the thought that uh, the world is a conceptual construction um, but it turns out that uh, the subject doing the conceptual construction is just as much a conceptual construction as the rest of the world that they are constructing so this is very much like right. the Borges story Okay. Right, right, right. That's um, right. And uh, I know that a number of people find this rather puzzling. Um, how can the world be a conceptual construction when the very thing of which is doing the conceptual construction, whether it's the, the, the person or indeed the language they use, is itself a conceptual construction? Um, it seems to sort of undercut the very ground of the distinction between a conceptual construction and something else. Um, okay. I mean, is this a paradox of, uh, okay. if there were Buddhist philosophers around, I'm sure they'd be saying that uh, I'm riding over the yeah. brush at all kinds of 
uh, sensitive things here. But um, the, the, the sort of parallel between this and uh, the Borges novel has never really struck me before. So uh, yeah, it's something there to be explored. Oh, I think so as well. I, I mean, it's um, it's something that I think it's it's actually easier to teach about um, in, in terms of student interest to get them into um, metafiction is with a Borges story. It's, it's just a you know it's almost too good to be true. <laughs> you know here here here's this really smart thing. Let's figure out what this narrative is doing in terms of. Um, coordinating what we think is true, what is, you know, or what's possible in terms of guarding the forking paths and, and how um, the construction of the story can be sort of um, looked at from object level, meta level, or, and levels beyond that. And, and the structures are really, really wonderful to, to try to teach students about, um, about philosophy of language and, and even you know, hopefully some, some dialectic logic. <laughs> well, you know, um, a, typical, uh, a typical way to um, try to avoid contradiction is to construct a hierarchy. Right. Um, you know, think, for example, of Tarski and the Lion Paradox. Um, um, Zumilo Frankel set theory and the Kintu hierarchy. So, th so these are ways in which, these are strategies or techniques right. that people use to get rid of paradox. But one thing that dialectists have always been rather fond of is um, bending the hierarchy, maybe collapsing it or maybe bending it back round on itself. But uh, that would be the story you just described, the circular ruins. Um, yeah. And the, right, I mean, that's, that's a, a really great example of that. So maybe there's something about um, this sort of uh, collapsing or bending hierarchies, which is um, a much more general application than simply you know, Tarski's hierarchy or the cumulative hierarchy, but something which applies much more to um, the, the, the structure of thought itself, um, not just sort of truth, but also emotions and um, fiction and any place where, where thought seems to bend back around on itself for some reason. Right, right. Um, yep, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. And you know what? On that note, I think we really <laughs> we've done quite well. <laughs> yeah, we've skated over a lot of thin ice. Um, I know. <laughs> that was fun. Okay. Well, it's been good talking to you. Oh, it's so great to talk to you. And um, and I'll keep working on uh, short fiction and and logic. And why don't you write another story or something? It's about time. Yeah, maybe. If, if when the spirit moves me. <laughs> okay. Look, uh, thank you so much. And you, Maureen. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.